Um, so Chris is, oh my gosh. Uh, so there is a history there. You were one of the co-founders of Favor, correct? Uh, correct. Yeah, I have we done a lot. <laughs> yes. So Favor, just to give you a heads up, uh, was one of the first one of the, um, the first startups in the first incubator cohort uh, about 10 years ago uh, in our old hot house. Uh, the company launched in slow, validated their business model. And when it was time to really press go, they moved to Austin and the company just blew up, became, you know, uh, got significant funding, did really, really, really well and uh, was acquired about four years ago. Uh, yep. 2018. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so quite, quite a significant success story for CIE. Uh, it was a, a, a good acquisition and that's Chris, that's where you started your startup career 10 years ago. Uh, and now, and so you're both a software engineer and a CFO. you that's a pretty unique combination of skills. Uh, I'm going to let you jump in and, and tell the story. You're now with a bound. Um, and you've been with a bound for seven years. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I can get into that a little bit with my little presentation. I have a little, uh, slideshow that I could share. Okay. Let's jump in. Let's jump yeah, in. Tell us, yeah, yeah. Kind of take you through the journey in chronological order. Um, can you see my screen here? Yes. So I've kind of named this presentation, the art of the pivot. Um, I think I'm exceptionally good at changing direction and, and doing something different. So that's the name of the presentation. Um, as Judy said, I'm, I'm a Cal Poly grad and, and I'm one of the co-founders of Favor and I'm just a serial entrepreneur. I've been doing startups basically ever since I left Cal Poly. Um, I found my start pretty much in uh, Dr. York's uh, Entrepreneurship 101 class where my roommate and I took it and we were just so inspired by all the other entrepreneurs that had done all these cool projects and found a lot of success. And it seemed like even in the worst case scenarios, the people had really good experiences. So uh, we decided that we had to do our own startup and the result was Favor. Um, and that's a, a long story, but I've also founded some other companies, um, Augmented Development and Track and Abound. And um, there's a lot of decision points and pivots in between that, that um, I'll share. Um, awesome. And yeah, feel free to jump in and ask questions at any point. And, and uh, yeah, we'll cruise along. So yeah, as Judy mentioned, I was a uh, co-founder of Favor and, and we were in the inaugural class of Hot House. Um, so here's a, a little picture down the bottom right. You may see some familiar faces there. And, oh my uh, gosh. So I see <laughs> Garrett. Garrett has four kids now on the bottom left. <laughs> uh, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, sorry, I had to, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. And you're so very fast. Yeah, yeah, there's a uh, good times, good times. So basically the way we started, I, I graduated with a, a degree in business and concentration in finance. Uh, and basically we wanted to build this, this app that would connect people to, to do favors in the neighborhood. And we didn't have any money to pay anyone to build it. So we moved into Ben's parents' basement in New Hampshire and taught ourselves how to code. And that was sort of the beginning of my software engineering uh, experience. And there's a picture of us in the, the top right here um, in the basement with one of our other roommates and, and Zach Murray. And uh, yeah, we basically, we were able to get into the hot house and that really set us up for success. Um, and it, it really came down to meeting the right people who introduced us to the right people who it, it's sort of like a progression of meeting people and introductions that leads to huge opportunities that you, you don't really expect. Um, so working on favor for a couple of years, I actually living the startup life, I really wanted to try out what it was like to have a normal job. And I tried that and turns out it's not that much fun, but I was <laughs> able to, it's, it's uh, not great. And, um, but it's, I did enjoy working with some, some really great people. And I ended up uh, meeting a couple of my co-founders for my next business, which was augmented development. And what we did is we basically had software engineers on demand that would uh, basically be hired out, um, sort of like a, 
kind of like, it's just on-demand software engineering. So whenever a company needed sort of an elite task force to come in and, and do something, they would hire us uh, to do it. And so we were really successful. I mean, we were profitable within the first 30 days, um, but we kind of hit a, uh, a limit to scalability where we realized that, that there, it really scaled linearly with our effort. So every new contract, every new um, uh, basically business that we set up, we had to kind of manually collect, uh, align the client with the contractor. And what happened is we had a lot of trouble recruiting new contractors to do the work, which made no sense because we were paying them something like $200 an hour, $300 an hour, which is the equivalent of something like $400 or $600,000 a year. But we kept hearing the same uh, resistance, which was that they wanted benefits. Mm -hmm. And it made no sense to us because we were thinking, we're paying you so much money, you can get whatever benefits you want. But they wanted employment benefits, and we weren't offering those. So what that sort of uh, led to was this realization that there was a huge problem in the 1099 self-employment space, which was that we saw the... Um, obviously the, the coming of, of the self-employed workforce and in, in things like Uber and Favor. And we saw remote work increasing. We saw basically the world was moving towards a distributed workforce that would kind of not be in the office nine to five. And so we talked to a lot of different contractors to kind of identify what are the, the big pain points. When you say benefits, what does that mean? And the first thing a lot of people mentioned was taxes. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I know way too much about taxes and, and please cut me off whenever this gets too, too boring. But basically, uh, most people are W-2 employees, which means they're salaried. They receive a fixed income each paycheck and their taxes are automatically withheld from each paycheck. So the amount of money that's deposited into their bank account is entirely theirs and it's, it's theirs to spend. And then at the end of the year, they go and they file a tax return and they get some money back. Yay. It's really simple. It's really easy. Uh, for independent contractors, they basically have to, with each paycheck, which is inconsistent and it, it may be related to some sort of billing process or invoicing or whatever, but it's usually inconsistent. They have to calculate the taxes that they owe on that, taking into consideration uh, different deductions and different tax brackets. They have to keep track of all their business deductions and their expenses. Uh, they have to then submit, whoops, they have to submit uh, taxes quarterly in the form of a quarterly tax payment. And then at the end of the year, they have to go and they have to have everything really well organized and file their taxes. And if they've screwed up any one of these many complex things, they'll probably owe a penalty. So what we did is we launched a company called Track. And Track basically did all of those things that sucked about being uh, an independent contractor. So what Track did is it's an app where you would... An, some sort of a self-employed person could connect their bank account. We would automatically pull in all their transactions, identify and categorize their incomes and expenses. So we'd automatically identify their 1099 income. We'd calculate the taxes on it. We would withhold the, the correct amount of money, set it aside into a little withholding account. We would pay the quarterly taxes so that they didn't get any penalties. And then at the end of the year, we would prepare everything that they would need to file so that the overall experience was very similar to, to being a full-on salaried employee. Uh, so what ended up happening is we were relatively successful, but it was never intergalactic growth. So we were able to onboard tens of thousands of users, and we submitted millions and millions in quarterly tax payments, and we even got to a, an annual recurring revenue of over a million dollars, but we were never able to get the unit economics really figured out. And what it came down to was our enemy was apathy and education. It really turned out that even though everyone knew and acknowledged that taxes was a big, complicated problem, when it came down to it, people didn't really want to deal with it. They just kind of wanted to ignore it until 
tax day came around and then they would deal with it and then they would forget about it again. So uh, basically, uh, yeah, we, we never really were able to, to find a, a consistent way to scale the business and the unit economics that made sense where we could go to millions of users. But where we did find a lot of success was in other businesses and organizations that had some sort of a vested interest in educating and um, helping out their, their clients that happened to be independent workers. So for example, uh, real estate brokerages, they were really interested in, in uh, partnering with us because uh, if you can imagine, put yourself in, in a real estate agent, you're, you're a selling luxury real estate, you only get a couple of, a few paychecks a year and they're huge. And what ended up happening is that they would kind of spend all of their paycheck thinking, oh, I will just pay my taxes on the next big commission check that I get. But what ended up happening is some of the best agents would essentially get bogged down in, in tax debt that they, would, they couldn't cover. And so the brokerages would have to come and help them out. Anyway, long story, the brokerages were very interested in, they had a vested interest in helping their agents manage their taxes. Um, and through all of this, we were talking to lots of other companies, lots of businesses that either had 1099ers as their users or were their customers or were their um, sort of members. And we kept hearing the same thing. So like, we don't really want to drive our users to your app but we'd really like to use your tax calcs within our own app. Is there any way that we can use your tax calcs? Or, you know, we, we don't want to like have to, you know, white label your app and, and we really want to maintain our user base, but can we use your tax payments? And so after hearing a bunch of these uh, sort of comments for a long time and with the, uh, the realization that the best way that we could actually get to a lot of users and 1099 users was through the companies that already had them and partnerships with them. Um, we launched, we decided to basically uh, offer what we call the track API, which is essentially just uh, offer all of the underlying infrastructure that powers the track app, which is the tax calcs, the payments, the withholdings, the automatic transaction identification. Uh, and let's just offer that as an API and sell that to businesses. So. In the early 2020, we launched with the Track API. We tried it, and it started taking off. Um, and and it really, basically, kind of surprised us how many how easy it was to basically sell this vision when when the problems really aligned really well. Uh, and so what we did is we actually thought that it didn't really make sense to to maintain the the Track uh, brand, and so we rebranded as Abound. And uh, this happened in about fall of 2020. So I don't have a lot of pictures there because it, it happened in the COVID era. And uh, so we were fully remote from day one, and uh, which gave us some advantages in, in hiring. And, and I can talk more about that. But basically, we went full in on being an API that provided uh, services, solutions to businesses that either paid or served 1099 income earners. And it sort of really quickly took off. And we really quickly raised a, a $6 million seed round, which enabled us to hire an exceptional team and um, to refine our product line and focus in and offer new products like 1099 W9 issuance and filing and uh, helped us acquire customers that were really easy to get, like fintechs, startup fintechs that were in our space, and then also move up market to larger companies like um, enterprise companies like HoneyBook and Dewalla. So yeah, that was two years ago and things have been going great so far and, and the journey continues. Um, so just some high level lessons learned through all of this is that basically being at the right place at the right time is pretty much 90% of it. Um, you can, and I like to think about it kind of like a surfer uh, sitting out there in the waves and the surfer can paddle all they want. They can paddle as hard as they want, but if they're not in the right place at the right time with the, with the right momentum, they're not gonna catch a wave. And so a lot of entrepreneurship is, seems to be just kind of positioning yourself in the right position at the right time to, to ride that wave. Um, 
don't solve problems that don't exist. And specifically, if your customer is unaware or doesn't care about a problem, then that problem doesn't exist. Even if you know it's a problem and it's a societal problem, a societal issue, if your user doesn't care, uh, your customer doesn't care, then it might as well not exist. So really focus on solving problems that your customers really needs to solve. If it's not on like the top one or two, maybe three problems in their life, it's just, it's going to get pushed to the side. Um, when it comes to, when it comes to making a pivot, be aware of the sunk cost fallacy, which is essentially the human cognitive bias where we take into consideration past investments, either in time or energy in making future decisions. So in a lot of, you, you, you can sort of get bogged down in uh, the feeling that, oh, I don't wanna change ideas at this point. I've put so much effort and time into this when really you need to forget about everything that you've done in the past and, and forget about the expenditure and just think about what are the best opportunities moving forward, forgetting about everything that I've done in the past. And it's really hard to do when you put your heart and soul into something. Um, and I think entrepreneurship is just a learning game. At, and it's kind of difficult to put a monetary value on learning itself. And, and learning doesn't always pay off in the short term, but it seems to always pay off in the long term. Um, so even when things don't work out, it's really important to figure out why. Why didn't this, this particular strategy or this particular product work? And once you have an understanding of that, it will help grow your expertise for the next time when, when you do something and you can bring back to that lesson. Um, and the last two are pretty related, which is, which is just, you need to talk to as many people as possible. And that the people that you talk to, don't be afraid to talk about your idea with people. Um, and people will help you in unexpected ways. And so I can, I can sort of look back at where we are today and, and think about, oh, we, we got this huge client. And the reason we got this client was because we were introduced to them by this person. And this person was actually an introduction to this other person over here. And, and you could sort of chart this unexpected network all the way back to some friend that you had that made the introduction. And so it, it really kind of made me realize the importance of talking to as many people as possible, making as many friends as possible in your space. Um, and, and basically opportunities are gonna show up eventually. They always do. If you talk to enough people and you're excited and passionate about your project and you know a lot about your space and your customers, opportunities will arise. Uh, and that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm open for questions or criticism. Um, thank you so much. That was super, that was such a good story, such a good uh, a path to explore with you. Um, I'll open up to questions, but I have one that comes to mind at the door. So you basically moved from a B2C model to a B2B model, really. Yes. Um, yep. How so? Was that a hard sell with your team? Uh, what were the team dynamics around being able to make that decision, that pivot? Do you have an advisory board that helped you know uh, get you on that track? Uh, can you talk about the actual pivot itself and the how that came about? Okay, so uh, to start with the team, um, our team was really focused on on the consumer facing app. So the team that we had, we actually, um, it's kind of complicated, but we actually sold our team to one of our customers, which was AARP. So we sort of like disintegrated our team entirely and started brand new. So the overall sell was uh, kind of unnecessary. And it's, it seemed like the only logical path at that point. So, um, basically getting everybody on board was relatively easy. And the overall um, kind of, I think, strength of our founding team was really on technology and business. It really wasn't consumer facing. So it actually felt very natural when we went from trying to build a consumer facing app to building a, a business solution, simply because that was where our strength was. Um, in terms of advisors, I don't, 
I don't remember any advisors giving any particular advice. Uh, so I, yeah. I'm, uh, well, I want to open it up to to questions from uh, our guests. Is, is there anyone want to jump in? No. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Please. <clears throat> Thanks for a great presentation. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. So you made a big point about um, solving the problem. Make sure it's a problem. Make sure it's a top two or three problems. So the road to get there may be not finding a problem in the top three, but continuing to find as you go to feel the market, learn from the market so that you can like dial in the even more so the problem that you're addressing and solving. So the journey from, because my fear is, well, I won't find the top three issues, you know, in the little niche that I am. So I'm asking about the journey to refine and, and address and solve the problem. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the industry that you are in so we can clarify? Okay, so um, it's, it's, it's a service geared towards visitors to the area that promotes a health stimulating vacation. So a lot of people go on vacation, they eat and they drink, they go home and they need a vacation. <laughs> But that might not be a significant problem because people want to go eat and drink and go back home, <laughs> right? So yeah. it's a fine idea, a health stimulating vacation, but is it uh, clear enough on the problem? Is the problem significant enough to develop a service? Ooh, I, I think it comes down to customer development. I'm a big fan of of the four steps to the epiphany and following the the sort of the steps to talk to your customers and understand what are what are the decision points. So for for yours, everyone, okay, they always say that startups are either kind of a pain pill or something like ecstasy, where it, it makes you feel <laughs> and so if you're not, it sounds like maybe you're less solving a problem and more like you're offering something that's 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 delightful and right. exactly. and so yeah maybe you're not solving a big problem maybe it's that you're offering a great experience i mean the tourism industry in general is not solving a problem they're offering something that's that's really cool and unique so i would just talk to as many travelers as possible to understand what is it that drives them what is it what are the decision points that matter to them when they're they're doing travel um, why does it matter? Why do they care? And where do they make these decisions? How do they make these decisions? And, and how do you reach them? And uh, I think it's just, you can't go wrong by talking to more people and, and understanding the problem more. And I'll tell you one thing, people will lie to you a lot. Yeah. You tell them like, oh, I, you know, I do, this is my business. And they're going to say, oh yeah, I would love to use that business. Don't trust what people say, trust where they put their money. And if they don't, if they don't, don't pay you or they're hesitant to give you their money, then don't believe them. Basically, believe money, don't believe words. Great <laughs> feedback. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And also, it's all about testing your assumptions, right? We, we, right. We, we talk about that a lot. I think we have so many, we don't even realize our subconscious assumptions that we're making. So maybe you're very healthy, have a very healthy lifestyle. And so you're projecting all that, right? So you're making that big assumption. Um, so yeah, testing, that's, that's the big one. Uh, it's trying to figure out what, what it, it's even harder, I think, to understand what your what assumptions you're making and digging into that to try and get rid of that so you can really hear what your potential customer is saying. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. We're loaded with cognitive biases and assumptions and preconceived notions. And what I've discovered is that most of the time you're just dead wrong. That right. you think you have an idea of what people want and you're probably just wrong, completely wrong. And so, <laughs> yeah. Dang. Does anyone here wanna share some experience around that? I mean, I know we have some startup founders where I know you you guys, you know, Morgan, Anna, you, you've, what are some key assumptions that you had made that you were able to debunk in your journey? 
Morgan. Well, this was like a long time ago. So when I first started working on my project, I thought that it was going to be for small independent businesses. And uh, later I learned that those people didn't, it wasn't on their top three problems. Mm -hmm. um, but for a large scale business, there was someone in the business where that was the number one problem. Right, so finding that person for who it is the number one, yeah, within the business. Yeah, that's that's a good one, yeah. What about you, Anna? Um, so for us, we make space for people who are more construction professionals. So essentially, we believe that you know we can expedite certain parts of their drawing processes, um, but we find actually that it's harder to integrate than we thought. We're you know we're we're giving them a solution, but it's harder to break that cycle and integrate into that workflow, even if we can expedite uh, a lot of their hours. So for us, it's about, you know, getting in touch with them and showing how it integrates um, because they don't have a lot of time to take a break to reteach themselves how to do something new. Um, so I think that's, that's, that was hard for us. Mm -hmm. There's a similar problem to what Chris talked, touched on with actually with a bound, right? Uh, or with, with track, sorry, that, that, initial problem of getting your youth to change their way that's the hardest thing i think that's the hardest challenge to start when you're trying to change someone's way of doing things um yeah sure i mean there's it's sort of are you creating a whole new market or are you entering a new uh, an existing market and offering just a better solution and so if you're just offering a better solution to something that they've already got and they understand well that's relatively easy but if you're creating a whole new market and a whole new solution, which comes with a whole new set of uh, habits that come with doing your job or whatever, then yeah, you have a big education game and it's going to take years to, to basically, they say something like seven years to build a market or to start a new market and educate the people and, and to grow it that way. So yeah, just, you know, what kind of market you're going into. Anna has a question. Yeah. Chris, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious to hear a little bit more about kind of just the operational and technical aspects of the pivot. So A, did you take on investment as you went? And B, did you operate under different entities as you went? And how did you kind of open and close them as you pivoted to different industries or that type of thing? Yeah. So Basically, uh, track and abound are the same entity, and it, it felt that felt okay because it was a very natural progression, and we were just taking all the resources and learnings from this one company and really just pivoting into something else. Um, so there, there was a lot of sub questions in there, so I want to be sure to address everything. Um, so basically, from a, a corporate perspective, augmented development was a whole different entity. We shut it down because it just was so different from track. And um, and then yeah, track and abound are the same entity and it just sort of flowed naturally into that just with a rebrand. So doing business as a bound. Um, and, and what were some of your other questions in there like operational? So going from track to abound, how did, if you took on investment, how did those investors take that? And what was that relationship mm. like convincing them into the new idea? So Abound was the actual first time that we were able to really easily raise VC money. At that point, we hadn't raised any VC money. We had essentially just been bootstrapped the entire time. And so that was um, initially taking friends and family money and living off of savings and doing a lot of consulting on the side. So I did a lot of, all of the founders did a lot of consulting work to essentially get by. And it was sort of a part-time job. Um, we, so our cap table was relatively clean when we switched to a bound. So it was pretty easy to, uh, for the investors to, to swallow the existing cap table. Um, they were, it was actually pretty, pretty serendipitous because our investors P72, they had essentially been working on a thesis around, they, they sort of saw the same problem we did, which was that there's this huge 1099 contractor workforce and 
there's no like sort of core solutions that solve the underlying problems. There, there needs to be an infrastructure company that solves it. There needs to be a Stripe for 1099. And so they already had this idea that we need to find a company that, that does that. And so when they saw us having years of experience being in this and we were like, oh, we're pivoting to this 1099, it just like, it was an easy fit and it, we didn't have to sell them or anything. They, they, knew, they already knew they wanted to, to be in this space. So it was, again, just the right place, right time. Gotcha. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, can we, uh, we do have a question that's been in the chat for a minute. Um, and it touches on the funding piece. So I'll address that and then what we'll go back to our in-person question. Uh, so how did you get the funding for your startup that first, you said you just raised 6 million. So tell us a bit about the funding journey, that first investor, how you connected, and then the next round after that. Yeah, sure. So the the sort of very first investor in all of my startups has been my parents they've always supported me in a very in a small way to to sort of help get us off the ground and uh after that it's been essentially angels uh writing checks anywhere from 10,000 to maybe like 50,000 and that was enough to essentially just keep the, the the technological overhead running uh me and my founders we were able to build everything so it was relatively simple for us to to sort of kind of pat, like wade sort of just hang out in place waiting for the market to kind of catch up to to where we were and what we were offering um it wasn't until and so we were never able to raise big vc money uh when we were a consumer facing app because they had very legitimate concerns that about unit economics about identifying and capturing these these independent contractors. They're such a diverse group. I mean, it's everything from like babysitters and dog walkers to surgeons and Uber drivers to retired people. Like the 1099 group is just so diverse that it was really difficult to capture them. Uh, so we were never able to really raise money, uh, VC money as a consumer facing app. And it wasn't until we switched into uh, a different model that that was pretty obvious that it would work because we were we had a lot of interest from customers uh, from clients and it was it was probably unfair because we had spent years in in the space talking to other companies that wanted kind of what we were doing and so when we launched abound we already had a, a, a set of customers that knew who we were what we were doing what we were offering um, so it was it was a lot easier to get investors on board and to understand our business model and how it could grow and scale. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, if you're having a really, really hard time raising money, maybe that's a sign also to, I, I just, this is something I'm just thinking about out loud uh, for the first time really. It's maybe you need to rethink the business model or the revenue model, or maybe there's something at the core that, you know, uh, it's, it's a big sign, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, investors are, they're not complicated people. They want to make money. And so if they don't think you're going to make money, they won't invest. And so if you can't convince a stranger that you're going to make money, then it's it's sort of like a kind of a gut check, a sort of an un, unemotional third party uh, group that will give you honest feedback about what they think. And that doesn't mean that they are right. Or that right, they, right, right, absolutely. They, I was gonna caveat that. It's like sometimes you just need to hang in there a little more and get that traction going, but yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a weird balance between yeah. uh, getting constantly denied by people and you're just saying, they just don't understand, they just don't get it versus sort of maybe internalizing that and saying, maybe, Maybe they're right. Maybe they do know something. And so it's it's a weird balance there. And I think it just comes down to like, hopefully, you know, your customers and your space better than they do. And, right. and yeah, you have to, it's, it's a weird line of optimism versus sort of skepticism. And you right. always have to be writing that. Yeah. On, on knowing your market, I keep, I think, keep thinking about passion, uh, you know, the, they developed a shoe with a removal heel a uh, woman founder, very hard to convince a room of, uh, sorry to be going there, but of, you know, white older males that this is, <laughs> you know, that she knows her market and they don't, right? So that, that that's one example where she definitely was in a position of being able to 
um, uh, claim that she knew that market so much better and, and understood it so much better than the investors she was talking to. Yeah, yeah, perfect example. Perfect example. Like investors don't only view real problems as their problems. And right. so they're, right. they're really excited to fund, I don't know, golf technology or something. But, right. but there's some truth to that. Like if they have experienced the problem or know someone who's experienced the problem, it's highly more likely that they will hear what you're saying and try to understand what you're saying. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. Any questions so, the ground? Oh, sure. And then we'll we'll jump over. Okay. Okay. Um, Chris, so it's it's no secret that B2B SaaS valuations are getting corrupted by the market right now. I'm curious, um, how did you get to that number uh, in your six million raise? Um, and you know, was it based on revenue or did you have investors help you? How did you kind of get to that? in that round? Yeah, so there's a few different ways to value assets. Um, when it comes to startups, you don't really have the same type of things like dividend discount model or, or ratios or comparables. So really when it comes down to it, the value of your startup is whatever an investor is willing to pay for it. And so the way that we got to our valuation is just negotiation of what the investor was willing to pay. That's pretty much it. There's, there's nothing. So you can do your best job at trying to uh, show why your market is huge, why you can capture all of it. And you can build models that, that show that, yeah, we have the potential to be a 10 billion, hundred billion dollar business. Um, at the end of the day, it's just, what is an investor willing to pay? And a lot of that is whether they believe your your model is is accurate or how accurate it is, or it's it's really just down to what they think. It's gut. Okay. So yeah, because of that, you see crazy swings in in like overall valuations depending on the market. So two years ago, the valuations were really high, and recently, in the last sort of six months, nine months, it's kind of dried up, and valuations have gone down. And it's not because the companies have become worse. It's just that the overall yeah. market sentiment has decreased. And so the overall mood and, and the, the vibe of what a company should be worth has decreased. So it's, yeah, it's such an irrational uh, process, especially in the early stages of a startup. It's, I mean, last year it was a hundred times and now it's yes. getting actually more realistic costs. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. No, it's, it, it is, it is, um, it's mind-boggling because it's irrational. Yeah, yeah. So, next question. So, my startup is thirty years old. So, I feel a little out of place here, but it's still relevant. Uh, launched Green Card Journal thirty years ago, focusing on electric cars, alternative fuels, high-efficiency vehicles, and started as an industry newsletter. We pivoted ten years later to being a consumer magazine and having a website. Things continue to evolve, and so I see a lot of people entering the space, mostly online. Um, and so there, I think there's a need for another pivot. And so I'm, I'm looking for that, and that's why the subject interests me. It's also why I'm part of this group, this organization. And I'm wondering what the best ways might be to get there. Listen to what you've said about networking, and uh, I don't think we've done really enough of that. But given that. I'm wondering what strategy should I be thinking about? Any thoughts on that? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you very well. I said, what strategy to do what now? I'm just curious about what strategies to pursue. If you have any thoughts about that, I mean, this is not software, it's not high tech, it's not what the conversation's about, but it is a pivot. And, and so I'm wondering, given what I've said about uh, where we are now after having pivoted in the past, any suggestions, any insight on, on what a good approach would be? Oh, so um, from what I heard, 30-year-old company, you've you've pitted, pivoted before in the past, uh, but you're in maybe more of a traditional media um, situation. And you're thinking about uh, you you thinking about advice for decision points on how to make your next pivot. Is that the question? It is. I mean, I'm listening to what you're saying about networking and how people come to you, and I'm 
if I think clearly about something, I'll pay more attention to. So that was a good point. I'm wondering, well, gee, what other points might you have given our need to look at where the market has gone? I mean, we have a website. We have, uh, we're, we're doing a lot of things. We're involved in the industry. We've won awards. We're recognized by our industry and well known, but the world moves on. So and yet another pivot I think is needed. I'm just curious about a strategy for getting there. Okay. Um, I think it all, I think you just have to pretend as though you didn't have anything. Pretend as though you were starting a brand new business and you hadn't invested any time or effort. You hadn't spent 30 years building this company. You hadn't done anything. You were going to start from scratch, except that you have the knowledge and you have the learnings that you have today about your, your market. What would you do? Would you, how would you approach it? I mean, pretend as though you're starting a brand new company and forget about all of the baggage that you have. And that is essentially what a pivot is, is if I was starting from scratch and I didn't have any of this nonsense that I'd done in the past, but I have a lot of knowledge and I know a lot, what would I do? And that's basically it. I mean, you can apply it to any situation. It's, I, I think that's it. What would you do? Right, right. That's a great, great way to look at it. Uh, letting go, yeah, letting go of all that history, but uh, taking advantage of the of the learning. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm checking. Is nothing? Yeah, yeah. Any other questions from the audience? So, Chris, where are you based right now, physically? I am unfortunately based out of Las Vegas, Nevada right now. I That's right. I remember we talked. That's right. Yeah. I used to be in uh, San Francisco, lived there for about seven years. But when COVID happened, it just made zero sense to be living in a tiny little box, uh, paying exorbitant rent. So um, my partner and I, we moved out and, and uh, I think I'm ready to come back to the city. To the, uh, are you going to go back to, to San Francisco? Uh, or maybe New York. I'm not sure, but uh, Vegas probably isn't for me. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, I can understand that. Um, we have another question here. Uh, the process of rebranding. So how did you go through that process? Um, so to be perfectly honest, I have two awesome co-founders that take up different parts of the business. And so the rebranding was mostly uh, the effort of our CEO, Trent. And so I, I mostly am like behind the scenes, making the technology run, building things, building out new efforts. Um, I'm less about the, the look and the feel and more about just the actual functionality and, and getting it done. Um, but what I can say about the process of rebranding, I mean, it was pretty straightforward. It was change all of your assets, change your, your URL, change your basically copy and paste Based. Anything says track, replace with a bound. And um, because we were doing such a radically different business, we, we needed a new website. We needed a whole new dashboard. We needed everything was that we needed was new. And so um, it was relatively simple. I mean, it was, it was more about just making sure that our customers that we had on the app had a soft landing. And so we we basically okay, yeah, that, that was one of my questions. So you, you said you had tens of thousands of users. So how yeah. you know do you just send them an email or a text saying, oops, you know, sorry, <laughs> we're we're no longer in existence? Or how, how does that work? No, we basically just sold them to uh to one of our competitors that offered many of the same services uh with the expectation that they would integrate our API. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So nice. yeah, we basically just changed a converted a a competitor into a customer. Oh, right. Awesome. Oh my gosh, that's great. Yeah. Um, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's always interesting. And like uh, when we work with our startups to prep that competition slide, uh, we do talk a lot about, you know, this could be your potential next acquirer, your next partner, but also your next client, right? Yeah. Uh, that's important. That's why you need to really yeah. embrace competition and get to know it really well. Right. I think in the beginning, uh, it's really scary to talk about your idea with other people. 
Right, uh, especially your competitor, yeah. Right, um, but it's, I mean, ideas are almost worthless. It's all about execution. And yep. so basically, if they can out-execute you, they're going to beat you. It doesn't matter if they have the idea or not. And so I highly encourage people to, and, and I wouldn't say network because I feel like network comes off a little bit uh, transactional, but build legitimate friendships with people um, that are competitors. And there's a lot of camaraderie that can happen between competitors. And honestly, as a startup, your competitor is not the one putting you out of business. It's the market. And it's it's the problem, maybe the Goliath companies out there, but your startup competitors are not going to be the ones, even though you are competing, they're not going to put you out of business. Yeah. At least in the short term. So true. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Chris, thank you so much. This, uh, this is really great. Amazing advice. Uh, love hearing your story. Um, there are a lot of resilience in there. Uh, yeah. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and yeah, if you move back to the West Coast, uh, let us know and uh, you know, let's stay connected. I'm overdue for a visit to Slow. That's that would be great. So stop by the hot house. You'll be, uh, I think you'll, you'll, I don't know, have you seen the new setup, the new hot house? I have not. Oh, okay. Quite different from the one that you, that you knew way back when. <laughs> okay. I'll have to come check it out. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you for your time.